Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Masterson from Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, and today I'd like to take you behind the scenes to show you one of our Johnson Sea Link human occupied submersibles. So, this is the Johnson Sea Link man submersible. This is Johnson Sea Link 2, uh, which means there was a Johnson Sea Link 1, and that was first put into service in 1971. The Johnson Sea Link 2 followed in 1975, and for the better part of the next 35 years, both JSL 1 and JSL 2 were in service at Harbor Branch. This is a four-person manned submersible. Two people, the lead scientist and the lead sub-pilot, sit in the sphere, and then there is an aft compartment where a junior scientist and a second sub-crewman uh, would reside. So four people would get in here, uh, and they would go originally as deep as a thousand feet. The first generation JSL uh, was capable of going a thousand feet deep. Uh, and uh, within the first decade of operation, um, maybe a little after that, the uh, capability expanded to go three times that deep. And that happened when the fabrication technology for that sphere improved. Originally, that sphere was multiple polygons that were epoxied together, and that was the reason there was the 1,000-foot limit. Once a uh, cast acrylic sphere could be uh, cast in a single piece, uh, overnight the um, depth limits uh, increased to uh, 3,000 feet. Uh, so the sphere is five inch thick acrylic and the diameter of the sphere is just shy of five feet. It is 58 inches in diameter. Interestingly, when the JSL approached its depth limitations uh, near that 3,000 foot mark, um, there would be a confirmation change. The pressure from the water uh, pressing in on the sphere would actually cause an audible pop and the sphere would shrink in size and actually lose about four tenths of an inch of its diameter. So you really had to have faith in the materials engineers that uh, they knew what they were doing when they put this together. So uh, you see from this front view uh, a camera system and collecting apparatus. There is a, uh, a slurp gun and there is a scoop and a grabber uh, and there is a uh, specimen box in the front as uh, well. And this is uh, all hydraulically uh, actuated so the box lid would open up when the uh, scientists wanted to drop something into the box. You also see a uh, carousel. This is a collection carousel that has a number of acrylic chambers. Uh, and it's attached to the, the slurp device. And when a sponge or some macroalgae would be uh, collected, it would be deposited into one of these numbered uh, containers in the carousel. Scientists would take some notes that would all be recorded on video, and then they'd hit a switch and that carousel would rotate and the next container would line up for the next specimen to be collected. That's the open chute, uh, so specimens could be dropped from the scoop or from the uh, grabber claw right into the carousel. So the goal was to maximize collection efficiency during a dive. Dive durations were typically about four hours, and in that amount of time, you had to descend to your working depth. You had to collect everything that you wanted to uh, before your dive time ran out. So they wanted to be as efficient as possible during that uh, collection. Uh, we can see uh, the thrusters on the uh, sub as well. Um, there was full XYZ maneuverability in the JSLs. They didn't glide like a plane or a glider. They hovered like helicopters. And so you had vertical thrusters, you had lateral thrusters in the front and in the back, and then the forward thrusters are uh, in the aft of the submersible. 
Here you can see the syntactic foam that was used to confer ballast. Uh, there also is a, uh, a tank here, and this tank could be filled with water in order to make the submersible negatively buoyant so the submersible would sink and then if the sub needed to rise in the water column you could fill these tanks with air and that would blow the water out and the sub would uh, would rise so uh, there were multiple ways to control buoyancy uh, uh, the subs did make their way into the Great Lakes at one time and that was a uh, an excursion into a freshwater environment and the water is not as dense in fresh water and so they had to actually add more of this syntactic foam in order to make up for that lack of buoyancy. I'm glad that there are smart engineers that think about those things because I certainly would not have. You see a number of uh, gas tanks along the side of the submersible. Some of those are used to uh, fill up these ballast tanks when it's time to bring the sub up and some of them are used for life support to provide a breathable atmosphere to the occupants. There's also a battery pack uh, down here as well. It looks like a big metal coffin, a very heavy rechargeable battery pack, uh, and this was the uh, duration limitation for the JSL dives. This is the reason that the dives only lasted for about four hours or so, and in between dives, the JSL on deck had to have its batteries recharged. So you're really couldn't do more than two dives in a day usually because you had about a six hour downtime in between dives while you were charging those uh, batteries. Um, with the battery pack on the JSL, um, the sub is uh, negatively buoyant uh, and without filling the, uh, the, the chambers, the, the uh, tanks here with air, it would sink to the bottom. But there were fail safes built in. There was a way to actually release that battery pack, to jettison it, to make the submersible positively buoyant and bring it to the surface in the event of an emergency. So the aft compartment, uh, you see the hatch down below. This was originally used for something called lockout diving. The rear, rear occupants would actually um, leave the sub. Um, they would open up the hatchway um, and uh, they, would, they would leave the sub wearing scuba or rebreather systems. They would do work at depth uh, and then go back into the aft compartment to begin decompression. They close up the hatchway, but the pressure would remain uh, and only be released slowly while divers did the necessary decompression. In some of the ship configurations uh, that were used with the submersible, there were on-deck decompression chambers, and this hatchway would line up with those on-deck decompression chambers, so divers that had to do long decompressions could actually move into a slightly room Roomier situation. When the uh, sub went from being a thousand foot capable to a three thousand foot capable submersible, this lockout diving technology became obsolete overnight. Uh, we set depth records doing this sort of diving, working at 600 and 700 feet, setting records um, that is much deeper than. Uh, even most tech divers will, will dive. Uh, usually that's only happening within a few hundred feet. But when our depth rating went to 3,000 feet, all of a sudden we were only able to do this work in about the first third or even less than the first third of that, uh, that new depth that we could achieve. Fortunately, it was okay. The timing was good because all of those collection devices that we talked about, the grabbers and the suckers and the uh, video camera systems, those were all coming of age. And so scientists were able to use all of that technology to make the collections that they needed to, to do the sorts of things that they 
needed to without putting the lockout divers into the water. So after the early 1980s, this became a high and dry one atmosphere chamber. It was no longer pressurized uh, for the purposes of lockout diving. So we are going to uh, go inside and have a look inside the aft compartment here. So here we've got a look around. There's a very small viewport on either side of the chamber. And that is life support back there. There is a carbon uh, filter there to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere uh, so that the uh, divers could uh, continue for the four hours without having CO2 building up. Um, and you see, I've got another flashlight here. Let me use that. You see so, some of the emergency uh, systems back here. There's an emergency built-in breathing system back here. Um, there is an emergency ascent, a surfacing uh, system back here. So if the controls in the front of the sub became disabled or the sub pilot in the front somehow became incapacitated, the uh, sub crew from the back was able to raise the sub. You wouldn't continue the dive, obviously, uh, but they could actually um, uh, resurface uh, and put an emergency buoy up uh, that would release from the top of the sub uh, so that the, uh, the, the sub can be uh, tracked down and a rescue could be effected. So there it was a lot of redundant safety features. Now remember, it was not one person back here, it was two people back here. So this was quite a, uh, a tight squeeze uh, during those dives. The Johnson Sealing submersibles were retired in 2010 after 39 years of operation. In total, the subs completed about 9,000 dives and were used by about 3,000 different scientists. FAU Harbor Ranch continues to conduct deep sea ocean exploration missions today. To find out more about that work, you can check out our ocean exploration and research tour on our virtual resources webpage. You can also find out more about our other research projects and public programs on our website.